China's Child Contracts, Chapter 2 Part 2 Three Frameworks of Communicative Behavior Collins believes that most human behavior is oriented towards the one fundamental normative system. He argues, however, that there are in fact three distinct normative systems governing action in relation to contractual behavior, 1. Social and business relation, 2. The economic deal, and 3. The contract. In this schema, parties to a contract think and communicate about their contractual relationship in one or other of these three normative ways. First, the social and business relation, hereafter the social relation, is expected to precede transactions and persists during and after performance. This normative system engenders trust between the parties, creates an environment suitable for contractual relations and, in my view, creates external standards by which reciprocal relations can be understood and evaluated. Second, the economic or reciprocal deal, hereafter the reciprocal relation, specifies the reciprocal obligations created by the discrete transaction and the range of economic incentives and non-legal sanctions that entice and restrict the insatiable appetite of self-interest. Collins is of the view that economic rationality provides the normative framework of reference for this dimension of contractual behavior in market transactions, for it is with this range of norms that the Chinese socialist market economy is currently grappling. There the contractual behavior that accords with the standards of self-regulation contained in the contract itself, hereafter the standard relation. In classical contract theory this last relation, applied consistently to the reciprocal relation, is thought sufficient in itself to resolve all disputes that may arise concerning the purpose and meaning of any contract. The standard relation is the internal standard against which reciprocal relations are measured and assessed. Collins believes that this three-tiered frame of reference is sufficiently comprehensive to permit rights and obligations, established by, 1, formal documents, 2, explicit agreements, and, 3, accepted customary standards, to be clearly identified and differentiated. It guides the parties in making assertions of rights and correlative claims to obligations to perform or pay compensation. The self-regulation provides another frame of reference by which to judge whether the other party has defaulted or cheated. How individuals navigate their way through these three communication systems is indicative of both their knowledge and experience of the contractual process. Collins contends that all three dimensions are always present in contractual relations. Although contractual behavior may attribute a dominant position to any one of the three communication systems at different points in the exchange process, the overriding purpose of the convention is to bring about environmental conditions within each state's party suited to the realization of child rights promises. The convention's set of child rights is intended to provide a blueprint from which states parties to the convention may develop, implement, and enforce a range of child rights laws. In light of this very direct paternalistic relationship between an international convention, on the one hand, and a set of domestic laws, on the other, it would seem logical for China's national and provincial legislation to be drafted to reflect both the form and substance of the convention. However, in view of the convention's emphasis on the crucial role of culture for the effective implementation of a child rights regime, the form and substance of China's child rights policies and laws needs to be culturally sensitized to ease, if not wholly resolve, the tension between universalism and culturalism, through some form or process of compromise, the nature of the relationship between child rights and child rights responsibilities, between children who have a rights entitlement and those institutions in Chinese society legally responsible for upholding and promoting those child rights is largely contingent upon the modernization theory the subject observer consciously or unconsciously brings to bear to perceive and interpret the child's promises, at hand. Modern international, child welfare law theory is predicated on the precept that children are harmed or at risk of harm whenever their rights are not recognized or upheld. Society must uphold and promote the rights of children, but at the same time it is also charged with satisfying the cultural needs and demands of its members a process of accommodation and appeasement which inevitably increases the likelihood that child rights will be infringed upon in some way or other. The convention promotes and validates the role played by cultural identity, 
language and values in the lives of children and emphasizes the importance of national values of the country for the development and well-being of children. On the whole, the convention characterizes and represents culture as a necessary force fulfilling a constructive role in upholding the provision, protection, participation, and prevention rights of children. Article 31, 2, of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, 1969 declares that in relation to a treaty, the preamble shall provide the context for its purpose. This means that to understand the Convention's philosophy and plan, it is crucial to closely examine and assess the relevance of the preamble to the overall purpose of the Convention. The Convention's penultimate preambular paragraph states that due account is to be taken by states' parties of the importance of traditions and cultural values of each people for the protection and harmonious development of the child. The convention makes many more references to tradition and culture, for example, local custom, cultural identity, language and values, national values of the country and, importantly for our child promises model, harmful traditional practices. The United Nations promotes a vision of universal child rights but, at the same time, also stresses the importance of tradition and cultural values for the development and well-being of children. Van Buren cautions that while it is the role of law to set standards aimed at eliminating all harmful traditional practices, such prohibitions alone are insufficient. She believes that this is because the primary function of traditional practices is in fact to define community membership. This means, amongst other things, engendering a strong sense of communal trust. Challenges mounted against traditional practices may well call into question the community's very identity and reason for existence and, rationally, no community is going to willfully challenge the very basis of its own existence. A mediatory step is required between the objectives of child rights and the realities of child rituals. If any significant progress is to occur towards the minimization of child harm caused by Chinese cultural practices, it is in contractual relations that the tensions between human rights and traditional rituals may be sufficiently accommodated, absorbed, and transformed to counter, if not reverse, the processes of social differentiation that have so far characterized China's great leap economic reforms. Modernization comes at a cost. Differentiation creates uncertainty. The general confidence individuals have that other individuals will act in a predictable way declines, and as the predictability of social action decreases the need to find integrating institutional forms increases. The differentiation of Chinese society brought on by economic reform, undermined the cohesive nature and unifying capacities of child ritual, thereby significantly reducing its capacity to minimize child harm. Since the environmental conditions in China are not yet suitable for the making and keeping of child rights promises, another form of child promise has come to fill the void between child ritual and child rights promises, that is, child contracts. China's child contracts are to be found along the entire promise spectrum, from highly discreet through to the highly relational. Child contracts have come to exert enormous influence over China's current reform environment in terms of both child rights and child ritual promises, so much so, that promises founded in child contract have, effectively, become the normative form of child promise in China's current social welfare rights program. China's emerging philosophy of contract in developing their thesis on Chinese modernization, Zeng and Zhang, to contemporary Chinese academics argue that in Europe over the course of the 19th century the law evolved from that of social status to social contract, while, at the same time, the law in China remained in the shadow of the patriarchal system and its relevant ethical code. They believe that China did not manage to complete the process of transition from the concept of the clan to the state, from an emphasis on the interests of the clan to personal liberty and historical evolution. This lack of transition has in their view severely hindered China's efforts to modernize its legal system. However, that is not to say China did not successfully develop an effective regulatory system, one which systematically ordered the day-to-day -day activities and behaviors of the Chinese people. The very fact of China itself, its cultural, social, and political persistence and resilience over such a long period of time stands testament to the existence of an operative regulatory system. Yet. A regulatory system alone certainly does not a functioning society make. Following Mao's death in 1976, 
China stood on a precipice. Fortunately for the future of China, the peasants took matters into their own hands, making spectacular use of Chinese culture's endemic system of exchange relations. The momentous decision taken in the winter of 1978 by 18 peasant family households in the tiny impoverished village of Xiagang, situated in the district of Fengyang, southern Anhui province, launched China on its third and most sustained Great Leap modernization adventure of the 20th century. These impoverished peasants turned production over to the family household, cutting themselves loose, says Zhou, of cadre control using the concealed knife of household production contracts Bao Jin Daohu. This act of rebellion by the most powerless in society directly challenged Mao's institutional vision for China. By subdividing land belonging to the collective, this small community of families defied the central government, risking arrest and imprisonment. Twenty years of collective farming had devastated Xiagang village and reduced it from 34 to just 18 households, forcing villagers to become beggars just to survive. In fact, T. Three former beggars from the village were the earliest to initiate the practice of household contracts. Remarkably, with fortuitous support and also acquiescence from provincial Chinese Communist Party leaders, this unauthorized allocation of land for use by individual family. Households within the Xiaogang production team heralded the tentative beginnings of China's extraordinary transformation. It signaled the initial stages of the transition from a socialist command or planned economy to a socialist market economy, from relationships based on class and political status to relationships based on economic self-interest, kinship, and contract. President Cheng Zemin's visit to Xiaogang in 1998 to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Xiaogang experiment is a strong indication of the enormous symbolic importance of this event in Chinese modern history. C. Elective peasants reclaimed their status as farmers, setting off a chain of events startling in their implication for agrarian productivity. In the end, the unorganized farmers' drive for a return to family autonomy and direction changed the social structure of the People's Republic of China more than did any of the changes in the urban setting. The strength of the farmers lay, believes Zhou, in the fact that they did not undertake organized resistance to the government. Instead, they negotiated on the return of family land use and restored an open class system, which laid greater emphasis on decision-making by individuals, within the context of the family household. They did all this by tapping into the latent power of kinship relationships that operate mainly horizontally but, to a lesser extent, also vertically in overlapping grids across Chinese society. What is unique about the history of Chinese legal and economic organization is the vehement ideological insistence on kinship as the organizing principle. Even in the case of large clan corporations in which kinship was the most threadbare fiction and many of the governing relations in fact originated in contract, not kinship. In China, as probably everywhere else, family businesses were among the first types of business organizations, yet even Chinese enterprises that were not family businesses often chose to present themselves as such. These informal contractual forms, that gave rise to the household contract responsibility system saw the family household withdraw from the collective and consolidate as a viable independent economic unit, were soon officially acknowledged and institutionalized by the state. Especially so, when it became patently clear that suppression of individual initiative and independent exchange behaviors was no longer a viable or even desirable option if the Chinese Communist Party was to continue exercising any real authority in China. Exchange relationships, based on notions of kinship are an integral part of Chinese culture and society. Historically, these relations have been oriented towards the normative system of social relations. However, with the advent of the Household Contract Responsibility System, 1978, and Socialist Market Economy, 1992, reciprocal relations based and evaluated on internal, rather than external, standard have emerged, acting as the basic operational relation in the more favored progressive locales of Great Leap China. Mao had feared the outbreak of opportunistic capitalism, from within the population should the Chinese Communist Party make the mistake of according the family household any real degree of economic and political autonomy, his fears were by no means unfounded. Historically, 
Strong centralized political authority has the effect of countering to some extent the unfettered institutionalized exploitation of women and children, the most powerless in Chinese society. It is during those periods in Chinese history when decentralized authority reigned, such as the warlord period from 1911 to 1934, that exploitative behaviors were at their height. During the 1950s, Mao effectively forestalled attempts from within the Chinese Communist Party to encourage individual initiative and economic activity at the provincial, district, local, or household unit level. With Mao's death in 1976, the greatest obstacle to the re-emergence of the family household as China's primary socio-economic unit had gone. Also gone were the ideological and practical constraints that had limited the capacity of adults to fully exploit the labor power of children. Child contracts, based on kinship relationships, having been so much a feature of China's feudal practices of the past, came to the fore once again. By permitting contractual relations to flourish, says Collins, the state effectively delegates to individuals the capacity to choose which social relations they wish to engage in. Understandably, some high-level cadres in the Chinese Communist Party, concerned at the diminishing role of the party and the polarization of society in terms of both wealth and status, made serious attempts to turn back the clock. To the institutionalize the household contract responsibility system and severely curtail the growth of the socialist market economy. Despite this rearguard resistance, the economic momentum and contractual environment in China has become so strong that, in many senses, it has taken on a life of its own, actively encroaching upon and overrunning many decision, making areas previously the exclusive prerogative of government in a one-party state. Economic constitutionalism, authoritarian legalism, and dual states the household contract responsibility system challenged the authority of China's socialist state. While ever the Chinese Communist Party exercised control over the economy and was able to redistribute wealth at will, social control was a relatively easy task. Once the monopoly over the distribution of resources and commodities was lost under the pressures exerted by an increasingly confident private sector, the state's authority to command the market became seriously compromised. Any crude reassertion of authority and control by the Chinese Communist Party would simply have the effect of stifling or killing off the socialist market economy, China's golden egg laying goose. The Chinese government is now largely captive to the market's normative system and power, from the start, this was a state of affairs it had tried desperately to avoid. It instituted measures such as the imposition of an ideological imprimatur upon its very own market economy, that is, socialist and attempted to prevent officials from playing an active role in a rapidly evolving commercial environment. The double bind for China is clear. To modernize, China needs the market, yet the market requires legal protections if it is to grow and prosper. If the Chinese state does not, or cannot, guarantee lawful economic activity, then the flight of international capital will be swift, as it searches for more law-abiding politically responsive jurisdictions. Does this then mean that the Chinese Communist Party is about to subordinate itself to the rule of law? The cherished hope of the international human rights community was that this logical double bind, created by the requirement of commerce for legal protections, would in fact serve to guarantee the successful introduction and establishment of an open human rights culture in 21st century China. The West was confident that, ultimately, the civil rights of the Chinese people must benefit from a system founded on the rule of law. This belief was based largely on a naive but widely held theory of economic constitutionalism, a belief in the mantra, a successful economy will beget a democratic state founded on constitutional guarantees for all its citizens. Kanishka Jayasuriya identifies what he describes as a dualistic notion of constitutionalism. One part is political and emphasizes issues of participation and accountability. The other is economic, with an emphasis on both market transparency and juridical limitations, limits on the influence of rent-seeking coalitions, or discretionary political intervention in the functioning of the economy. The view in the West that capitalism requires and wholly depends upon a liberal rights environment supported by the rule of law in which to grow and flourish, is largely being dispelled by developments in today's Great Leap China. Jayasuriya argues that what is occurring in China and other countries of East Asia is not the development of constitutional democracies but, rather, 
the rapid growth of authoritarian legalism, dot, a rule of law that does not lead to the diminution of state power, as would be expected from a liberal perspective, the rule of law acts, not as a break on state power but as an instrument for its expansion. One important manifestation of this phenomenon is the development of a system of private rights entitlements in the economic sphere, removed and disconnected from the growth of the public sphere of political participation. J. Assyria locates the rule of law in East Asia within the framework of the illiberal political structures that dominate so much of the region. In other words, legal institutions, like other institutions, are embedded in a wider ideological context. It is a nonsense though undoubtedly an appealing and lucrative nonsense for many international organizations, private consultants, and also academics, to think that liberal institutions and practices, such as the rule of law, can simply be engineered to accommodate the right set of economic conditions. J. Assyria refers to states operating under authoritarian legalism as dual states. This is where there is a parallel existence of both an economic order regulated by law, and a political sphere unbounded by any legal parameters, joining economic liberalism to political illiberalism. Understandably, a dual system where economics and politics are artificially separated has dire consequences for the implementation of any viable child rights culture in China. This is simply because a system of child rights, as conceived in the convention, cannot exist in a political vacuum. Its viability and relevance to children's lives is intimately linked to the philosophy of liberalism and its related doctrines and institutions. The language of rights and relationships The development of a language of legal rights depends, believes Morton, upon the emergence of a civil law practice for which the overarching idea is the protection, by force, of the interests and entitlements of societal members, including children, the reform of China's economy, in such areas as state-owned enterprises, SOS, and township and village enterprises, TVEs, was thought to be a crucial first step in this transformative process towards a civil society. One can identify, say White, Howell, and Shuang, a strong and growing sphere of social association, a corporatism, in China which exhibits features of civil society. However, T, his emergent associational universe is segmented and stratified, being composed of layers which differ widely in the nature of their relationship with the party state. T. His sociological conception of civil society has its limitations as a description of current Chinese society. It tends to provide partial and static snapshots which blind us to the important elements of the reality and cannot capture the dynamics of a rapidly changing social universe, although White et al. chose a sociological rather than the more traditional political conception of a civil society. It is clear that China is far from establishing even a stable associational form, let alone a set of institutionalized relationships between state and society based on the principles of citizenship, civil rights, representation, and the rule of law. Key elements are still missing from a legal regulatory system necessary for the support of a functioning market-based economy. This is despite, as Brendan Byrne points out, well over 1,000 of China's largest state-owned enterprises being listed on Chinese, Hong Kong, and international share markets. What is not missing, however, are the kinship relationships that characterize, underpin, and power the East Asian economic system. The importance of relationships in doing business in Asia partly reflects cultural factors. However, it also was a rational response to the lack of laws and regulations that have hitherto made parties unknown to one another risky in many Asian economies. Moreover, people used relationship structures to drive their economies because these worked, delivering more rapid declines in poverty for more people than ever before. I. F. Emerging regional economies cannot overcome vested interests and correct legal and regulatory system weaknesses, Business may be forced to revert to the old relationship-based approach. What is of concern in the current trend to internationalize law, is the Western tendency to rush to law and use it in a purely positivist manner. This has the potential to undermine and significantly threaten the integrity and viability of extant functioning cultural systems, especially those that espouse and exhibit communitarian values. David Kennedy argues that the posture of human rights is an emancipatory political project which extends and operates within a domain above or outside politics delegitimates, other political voices and makes less visible the local, cultural, 
and political dimensions of the human rights movement itself. An over-reliance on law to uphold and promote a system of child rights may well prove counterproductive in China, in the short term at least. A functioning system of Chinese child promises is already in place, otherwise the majority of Chinese children could not grow to adulthood. Before replacing one system with another, it is important first to understand how the existing system of child promises operates, the nature of its processes, and to what extent it minimizes child harm. Child care and protection paradox Intuitively, it seems obvious that steps aimed at eradicating ritual practices which harm children, such as genital mutilation, infanticide, child begging, child marriage, and child prostitution, dot, should ultimately serve to strengthen the integrity of culture. Culture contains within and of itself, however, a child care and protection paradox. While traditional rituals provide the means by which children are culturally socialized to be Chinese, these same rituals are also the cause of most of the trauma Chinese children will ever experience. Jennifer Nedelsky argues that rights theory is in dire need of socialization. She points out that most liberal rights theories do not see relationships as being central to their understanding of the human subject. The self to be protected by rights are seen as essentially separate and not creatures whose interests, needs, and capacities routinely intertwine. Thus one of the reasons women have always fit so poorly into the framework of liberal theory is that it becomes obviously awkward to think of women's relation to their children as essentially one of competing interests to be mediated by rights. So, it is not that I think the concerns about the individualism associated with rights are unjustified. Rather, it is my hope that the notion of rights can be rescued from its historical association with individualistic theory and practice. Human beings are both essentially individual and essentially social creatures. The liberal tradition has been not so much wrong as seriously and dangerously one-sided in its emphasis. What rights in fact do, says Nedelsky, and have always done is construct relationships of power, of responsibility, of trust, and of obligation. While these relationships are a central feature of child rights, of course, it must also be recognized that child rituals and child contracts are also in the business of structuring power relations, and this is something they do very well. It is the making, exchange, and keeping of promises that is a universal feature of human relationships in all cultures of the world. The utilitarian value of a child contract is that as an institutional instrument it can accommodate the cultural complexities of child ritual promises and, at the same time, create an effective internalized set of child rights, rights based, not on universal principles of human rights but, rather, universal principles of human promising, human beings the world over, understand what it is to make, keep, and also break a promise, in driving cars, Motorists make and keep a mutual promise that they will abide by the rules of the road. The many, the collective, rely upon both the goodwill and, particularly, self-interest, a sense of reciprocal relation, of each and every other individual. A child contract is a contractual promise made to protect the interests of a specific child. Of course, a child contract right is to be distinguished from a child right per se in that the latter is expected to somehow stand independently on its own. In contrast, the contractual right is totally dependent on the continued existence of the following factors, 1. The contractual relationship itself, 2. The parties to the contract, and 3. The set of social, external, reciprocal, self-interest, and standard, internal, relations that comprise each contract. The universal principle at work within the child contract itself has nothing whatsoever to do with the right of all children not to be harmed. Rather, it is all about the very selfish utilitarian need of each and every one of us to ensure that promises made are somehow kept. Anything less would lead to a state of anarchy which, in turn, would directly threaten the continued social and material existence and well-being of us all, including our children. Ruskala maintains that Chinese society has prospered due mainly to the inherent vitality of contractual relations, based as they are on the principle of kinship. Entire networks of commercial relationships have been shaped throughout China's long history to suit what Ruskala calls an all-pervasive family metaphor. Not only is this familial conceptualization seen in the structure of the Chinese clan system, 
but it is also clearly evident in the development of China's second-generation communist Danway system. State enterprises form part of the C. Communist Household Registration, whereby each citizen is assigned to a unit, Danway. For its members, the unit is much more than a workplace, it is also a place to live, raise children, socialize, grow old, and buy. Indeed, T. He Chinese manager typically describes the Danway production unit under his auspice as a family, a big family. It may not be quite as good as the traditional clan, which provided care even beyond the grave, but it is a remarkable welfare system nonetheless. The familialization of relationships is fundamental to Chinese culture. Kinship was the precondition for group membership in China. Quite elaborate legal devices were developed to bring non-kin within the kinship group. Contractual instruments and legal technologies created fictive kin relationships where none previously existed. Adoption is a prime example of a transformative institution with the capacity to legitimately bring about fundamental change in a child's social status within the relatively rigid parameters of Chinese familialism. Another fiction is the child contract, which involves the making of a mutual promise, where the child is required to keep a promise to their parents, to provide material support when called upon to do so. Unlike parents in the West, Chinese parents do not make a unilateral promise to their children, for there is every expectation that the detriment sustained by the parents will reap a real tangible benefit sometime in the future. This is because, within the context of Chinese culture, a promise is made simply by the ritualist fact of a child having the status of child. Here we have the intimate relationship between Chinese ritual and contract. How else can the norm that Chinese children support and maintain their parents be explained? Is it simply the case that they feel some obligation because their parents supported them? No. In terms of Chinese culture and society, it is much more than that. The Chinese child has a promise to fulfill in return for something he or she has already received. If the filial promise is not fulfilled then the child commits a breach, not only of social mores but also contractual obligations. Such breaches can have dire life-threatening consequences for children and family members.